And that most basic type of magnetic field is that one surrounding a bar magnet. Just remember that magnetic field lines go out of the north pole of a source magnet and into the south pole. If you have two opposite poles, maybe they're from different magnets or maybe they're from a horseshoe magnet. It really doesn't matter. If you have two opposite poles, it's out of the north and into the south. The difference is that this magnetic field on the left is non-uniform. If you look at the, the field line density, how close the lines are, it varies depending on the location. Whereas in this vicinity directly between the poles of that north and south pole on the right-hand field diagram, those are uniformly spaced, so the magnetic field is uniform. Then we got into the right-hand rule, so you also need to know how to determine the direction of the magnetic field surrounding a current-carrying conductor. And that's also on the handout I've given you. If you turn it over, you'll see these two diagrams. You just have to remember that your thumb of your right hand points in the direction of conventional current, and your fingers curl in the direction of the magnetic field. You also have to be able to determine the magnetic field direction or orientation and the poles associated with a solenoid. But that is really just applying this curly right hand rule. So for example, if I say to you, and imagine that we don't know which pole is which on this solenoid, and I say to you, we want to find out which pole is which, these lines that are poking out from the left-hand side are either going in or out. Okay? If, if you don't know, you know there are lines there. Now, how do you do that? What you do, this is the negative terminal of the battery, is you grab this wire in your head, which is out in front of the solenoid, and you grab it with your thumb pointing in the direction that conventional current would flow, which would be down this wire, down at an angle, but generally down to the negative. So if I grab a wire, this wire is in front of the solenoid. This is, the, this is what I'm indicating here is the middle of the solenoid. This is inside of it and I grab this with my thumb down, the only question I have to answer is, which way do my fingers curl inside? Do my fingers curl that way, or do they curl out? And if I grab it with my thumb down, my fingers behind the wire, which is where the center of the solenoid is, are pointing in this direction. Which means that these field lines go in, here, which means they have to go out on the other side. But going back to this diagram, you know field lines go into the south. So if you've determined that the field lines go into the left side of the solenoid, then you've determined that that's the south pole. Now, where we left off yesterday was with this statement. We talked about solenoids. We used the right-hand rule to find directions of magnetic fields. And the demonstrations I'm going to do are not, are not demonstrations relating to the right-hand rule. Give me a second. They are only related to what's on the board. And what we're going to be doing is doing some quick measurements of magnetic field. I was a little disappointed when I opened up tried to open up that application on my phone this morning that said it's no longer available, but I found a better one. Well, the one I had before had an X, a Y, and a Z measurement of the magnetic field. And then we had to take X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared and take the square root to get the net magnetic field. This one, and Ashley, you're going to help out, has a blue, a green, and a red magnetic field measurement. Those are your X, Y, and Z, but at the top there's a white one. And the white one is the net. And we don't even have to look at the scale. If you look at the top of this, and I can't take a screen capture of my phone because my home button doesn't work. So I have a, uh, an app that mimics the home button. But when you use that app to take a picture, you're taking a picture of that app, not what's behind it. So uh, you know, I'll maybe pass this around a little bit. But 
at the top of this, it actually tells you what the magnetic field strength is, what the total is. It tells you what the x is, what the y is, and what the z is. So what is the magnetic field strength at the top in white, approximately? 126. 126, and it's microtesla. Now, that's stronger than the Earth's magnetic field, so there's some magnets in here that are affecting it. Okay, I would, I would probably say that if I took it off of your desk, and held it here, it's at about 89 microtesla. But what we're able to do with this is measure a magnetic field. Now, I've <clears throat> I kind of think the magnet magnetometer is here. I've kind of figured out that that's where it is. And I want to be careful not to use too much current because what I did this morning was I took this magnet and I put it against my phone, and the app just showed zero all of a sudden. So I think it was messing with the sensor inside. So I'm going to turn this on and um, McKenna, can you tell me what the current reads? It's not nothing, eh? Or does it read something? What is it? 4.4? Okay, so 4.4 amps and I'm going to tell you what the magnetic field strength is here and the magnetic field strength is about 66 microtesla. And I'll keep track of this up here. So at 4 amps, the magnetic field strength is 66 microtesla. So in theory, since we've said that the current is proportional to the magnetic field, if I double that current, I should get double the magnetic field. And you will have to trust me on this. So what was it, 4.4? Okay, so I want to go to 8.8. .8. I mean, it doesn't have to be perfect. And I'll try to put the phone in the exact same position. And I'm not lying, it's 124. If you don't believe me, you can come up here. And I'm not making these numbers up. It's 124, which is... That's pretty close, isn't it? Um, I mean, it's not perfect, but also, you know, if I put my phone in the place where I think it was and I shift it a little bit in one direction or the other, it changes. So I'm trying to imagine where it was. Right now it's 134. So if I take 66 and I double it, I get, what, 132? We had 124, 134, that's, that's not bad. If I were to go to, uh, what's 3 times 4.4? Well, let's just double 8.8. 8.8 .8. 8 .8 doubled to 17.6. So I'm going to go up to set a whopping 17.6 amps. And I should be getting at 17.6, since it's twice this current, I should be getting, in theory, 250 microtesla, approximately, or whatever, I guess, 4 times 66 is, if you want to go with that. So put it in here. Two hundred and sixty-five. So I mean that it's certainly bearing out this idea that the current is proportional to the magnetic field. One of the other things we said is the number of loops affects it. So I'm going to go back down, down to a smaller current. Notice when we did all of, the, all of this data, I'm go back down to 10 amps. When we did all of this data that we just collected, I kept the coil the same. That's my constant. Here, I'm going to keep the current the same and change the coils. Sorry. Uh, so that's 10 amps. Is that right? You can see it on there. So now I'm going to measure the magnetic field. And this, I like this app better. Oh, and I did something, and now all it's showing is that. It's not even showing the graph. I don't know what I did, but I like that better. Um, this is, put it right there, 170. 170. So 10 amps, 10 amps 
one turn of wire is 170 micro Tesla. So now what I'm going to do, tell me when the light goes off. It's off. It's hot. Is swap this out for this, and this has eight turns of wire. In. No, I am not. I'm not interested in this demonstration in which way the magnetic field goes by using the right hand rule. We, we talked about that with the solenoids. I can certainly go back and show that to you a little later if we have time. Okay. So this has eight. In theory, what's that? Eight, five, sixty, thirteen hundred and sixty micro Tesla. Can you work it out for me, please? If I keep it at 10 amps and change it to 8 turns, I should get 8 times. And by my count, that's uh, 1,360. Yeah? Let's go turn this on first. Is it still at 10 amps? Sixteen hundred and forty. It's not bad. The other, the other thing is, of course, these are really thick wires, and you know they're not ideally in one space, so it's not a perfect solenoid. Um, I'll do that again. No, no. Eleven sixty-five. Can you just take a look? I mean, it's dancing up and down around there, but 1150. Well, let's call it 1150. We're off by a couple of hundred micro Tesla, but you get the basic idea. If I were to, we'll, we'll try one more thing, because we did say, light off? We did say that the size of the radius affected things. So the only two that I have that we can compare this one and this one. I can't compare these other two because I don't know why I did this, but this green one, although it's a bigger radius, it also has fewer coils, fewer turns. So I want to I want to keep the number of turns the same. I want to keep the current the same, but I want to change the radius. And I don't know. Can you do me a favor while I'm setting this up and just measure the approximate diameter of that? I know it's kind of a flattened circle, but I'm interested in a diameter. About 25 centimeters. And this diameter is 9 centimeters. Oh. 25 over 9. is 2.7 repeating. Which means, since it's an inverse relationship, the magnetic field here should be 2.7 times as great as the magnetic field with that one. So I'm going to, because there's only one uh, loop of wire, I want to use a very high current here. And if you smell something burning, it's just the insulation on the wire. So the highest I can go is 25.9 amps. And I'm going to try to keep that fixed. And the magnetic field, it's going to be tough for me to hold it directly in the center there, but I'll do my best. The magnetic field here is 350, 360. Let's call it 360. So with the 9 centimeter radius, we get, how did I just forget that? Three, did they say 350? 360, so around there. Okay, but I'm in the right neighborhood. And by the way, you know, if I just go in a little bit, it's getting closer to 450. If I go out, it's 250. Maybe I'll find the strongest one. The strongest one is actually 560. 
And then what I'm going to do with the bigger one is I'm going to try to find the location in space that has the strongest. So 560. Uh, micro Tesla. Um, <clears throat> what's 560 divided by 3? 180? 180, 186. So that's just, you know, back of the envelope calculation, rough estimate. What did you just say? Well, rounded. Rounded. 187. You know, so I'm going to disconnect this now. Off. And we'll use this one, which has a bigger radius. And again, we're not worried about the direction here. The magnetic field may be going towards you or away from you. My app on my phone doesn't care about that. It's just telling me the net magnetic field. When we talk about the potential difference here, and I don't know what voltage we have to produce that current, it doesn't matter. When we had that 25.9 amps, there's a potential difference that's pumping all of the electrons to a region of high energy to no energy. Because this is not a light bulb, the electrical energy is not turning into light. It's just turning into heat. Okay. Um, we just want to make sure that we are still at 25.9 amps. And again, I'm trying to find the biggest one. I'm at 171 right now, 175. One, now I'm back down to 174, 179. Well, there's a 185, 186. What 190? I can get 190 here. <clears throat> so at 25 centimeters. For a radius, I get 190 micro Tesla. You know, if I take the bigger divided by the smaller, I should get 2.7. When we did it before, we just divided by 3, right? But I don't know what effect that's going to have on things. 560 divided by 190. That's, that's pretty good. What kind of percent error is that? Minus 2.7 repeating divided by... 2.7 repeating times 100. I've always said if you get anything under 10% in high school physics, you're doing a good job. Closer to 5%, it's excellent. I mean, that's not bad for just a rough approximation and some circle that's not even really a circle. Okay. So I did want to show that to you. I also want to show you an electromagnet. Um, So this electromagnet has coils uh, inside of here. There's a, a little O-ring kind of clip that comes off, and there's a, a solenoid in. And one end of the solenoid is here, one end is there. And I'm going to be connecting this to 3 volts of potential difference. I can't connect it to a power supply because it'll just burn out. There's hardly any resistance here. so. Either a breaker would trip if I connected it to a power supply, or the wire would burn out, okay, like a fuse. So I'm using a battery. Um, and then this goes on here. And uh, if I give this to you, and, and we can pass it around later so everybody can try it, there is a little bit of magnetism there. I can kind of feel a little bit of attraction. When I plug it in, and the first time I saw this, I was kind of surprised in a number of ways. I thought this thing would slam together, but it doesn't. It just, it just clips on, okay? However, you look like a strong lad. So take this one and try to put them together so they're dead center on dead center when you do that. Okay, now, now pull them apart. Come on, Brody. Come on. We're waiting. It can't be done. That can support 1,000 pounds, believe it or not. If you had 
you know, a strong enough cable and you attach that to the ceiling, you can hang over a thousand pounds on here before it will break. There is a way to get them apart though, and it's to slide them apart because the force required in that direction is less. But there's no way you would ever pull them apart. And again, I'll maybe pass this around as we're finishing things off. It, it seems like when they're together and you go, well, I can't pull them apart, it seems like they should slam together. They don't. They just kind of clip together. So I'll pass that around. We're going to be moving on here, but uh, it, it's one of these days. It's like, what's that, sword in the stone? Excalibur? Like if you can pull them apart, you're, you're the physics master of the universe. All right, we're going to move on here. And actually, I changed my mind. After Colby, after you're done with it, just put it on the back counter, and then I'll pass them around at the end of class when we're less focused on what's going on up here. We're going to move on now at the top of the next page and talk about a moving charge in a magnetic field. And I think we might actually finish this and get started on the next lesson and then maybe do a written response or maybe some kind of lab tomorrow. But I, I don't want to just finish this lesson and end there today. I think we have time to move on. So if you have a moving charge in a magnetic field, and that magnetic field is sometimes referred to as an external magnetic field. And you need to be careful here because what I'm talking about is having a charged particle. I'll use my metal sphere to mimic the charged particle. This charged particle here moving past another magnet. So this magnet has what we call an external magnetic field associated with it. It's called external because this charge, when it's moving, has a magnetic field around it. This is going to get really complicated. So when a charge is in motion, it creates its own magnetic field that encircles the charge. I can go back and show this to you because we did a couple of examples like this right there. When a charge is moving through space, it has this circular magnetic field associated with it. Same with a negative charge, and you use the curly right-hand rule to determine the direction of that magnetic field. Okay, so so what? Well, if a moving charge has its own magnetic field around it, and it goes past another magnetic field, those two magnetic fields are going to push off of each other. The reason why... The reason why, I'm going to be careful because I did get hurt this morning. Magnets got away from me and clipped the skin here. The reason why these are pushing away from each now they attracted. And the reason they attracted is this magnet is so strong, it flipped all of the domains in this weak magnet. Okay? But the reason why, the reason why they are attracted or repelled is because the magnetic field around this magnet interacts with the magnetic field around this magnet. So there's a repulsion or there's a, a magnetic force. What that means is that if that charge that has its own little personal magnetic field moves through another magnetic field, that charge will experience a magnetic force. Are you with me on that logic? I have a picture that we'll look at in a second. The direction of the magnetic force is found using a different right-hand rule, which you haven't learned yet. The magnetic force created is sometimes called the motor effect. Here's why. When you look at an electric motor, you connect an electric motor to a battery, and the thing spins. You get mechanical energy coming out because the shaft or the coils on the shaft experience magnetic forces. And later on, we'll talk more in this unit about the motor effect. But right now, I want you to try to get it into your head that when you put in motion of charge and you get a force coming out, that's the motor effect. So what we're looking at here is the following situation. And you can take a picture of this 
that I'm going to show you in the end once it's all complete, if you like. We have a uniform magnetic field, and I've got a positive charge moving in the direction of that velocity vector. That positive charge has an itty-bitty magnetic field around it, which we could determine using the curly right-hand rule. So I want everybody to make sure you were aware of how to get this direction. You're grabbing that charged particle with your thumb pointing up and your right hand. Fingers are curling in the direction of that purple magnetic field. What I'm telling you is that this red magnetic field and this purple magnetic field push on each other. And if I say to you which way will the particle be forced, you'll go a little bit crazy. Because some of its magnetic field is in one direction, some is in a different direction. It doesn't seem as though it should be pushed, but it is. And it is going to be pushed out towards you. The magnetic force is out of the page. I'm not sure why I have two here. And I know that because I know the second right-hand rule. So, by the way, when we determine the direction of that force, we do not consider that little tiny circular magnetic field. I, I want to go through this again. <clears throat> this charged particle is moving through that external magnetic field. Because it's a charge and it's moving through space. It has a magnetic field associated with it. This purple magnetic field interacts with the red magnetic field to produce a magnetic force. But to determine the direction of the magnetic force, you don't have to worry about that circular magnetic field. And here's how it goes. You take your right hand, but this time it's flattened out. Okay, So do that for me. Right hand and it's flattened out. And your thumb is perpendicular to your fingers. It's not like this, it's like this. Okay, And your fingers, and this is the way I remember it, your fingers, there's lots of them. And when we draw magnetic field lines, there's lots of magnetic field lines. So you have to point your fingers of your right hand, keeping them kind of together so they're not splayed out, is in the direction of the magnetic field. Your thumb is in the direction that the particle is moving. And out of the palm of your hand, is the direction it's forced if it's a positive particle. And I remember P for positive, P for palm. So this is the right-hand rule. Now I'm going to hand out a second handout for you that has both right-hand rules on one sheet. The curly right-hand rule, that's what I call it, which you can call right-hand rule one. And then right-hand rule two is there as well. You. You're welcome. So you don't get to keep these little handouts on exams, but they might be helpful as you go through some work. You're welcome. And what we're going to do now is practice that right-hand rule. And then we're going to look today at a formula that we can use to calculate the amount of that magnetic force. So once again, and you know, your, your brain has to be somewhat adaptable. This is not the diagram that I just handed out. But it's the same thing. Your thumb is the direction that the charge is moving. This is trying, uh, being drawn in kind of three dimensions here. Your thumb is the direction the thing is moving. The magnetic field is the direction of your fingers. And the magnetic force is out of the palm of your hand if it's a positive particle. I didn't add anything extra here, but we could draw an arrow going out of the back of your hand if it's a negative particle. So let's take a look at some examples. Oh, that's the one I've given you, basically. Is that right? Okay. Um, 
For each of the following, determine the direction of the magnetic force on the charged particle once it enters the magnetic field. So what do we have to know? Well, we know that we use the second right-hand rule. We know that our fingers are in the direction of the magnetic field, and we know that magnetic field is north to south. So I have to, now you're, you're at your desk, so you may have to you know, do some maneuvering there. But I can, facing you, it's a little easier on my joints. Magnetic field north to south. You gotta, you gotta somehow keep your fingers in that direction, but have your thumb pointing in the direction that the thing is moving. If I were sitting at a desk, and this were on paper, then I would be holding my hand like this down on the desk. Right? My fingers are to the left side of the page. My thumb is towards the bottom of the page. Or if you're doing this up here, you have to kind of maybe lean back a bit to give your shoulder a bit of a break. So the bottom line here is your palm is facing in. That means the magnetic force is into the page once the proton gets there. And again, trying to draw a direction into the page is difficult. So what we would do is we would just say, well, into the page is in this direction. You OK with that? Try another one. Now we don't have a diagram. We have to sort this out in our head. And I'm going to, whenever possible, do these types of problems in real directions. Like north is that way. I'm, I'm pointing north. I'm not imagining looking at a map here. I'm saying that's north, that's east, that's west, that's south. So an alpha particle is traveling west. That's in that direction. Across the surface of the Earth. Well, what's the magnetic field? It's the Earth's magnetic field. And we need to know the Earth's magnetic field is towards the North Pole, the North Geographic Pole of the Earth, which is actually where the South Magnetic Pole of the Earth is. Now you have to hold your hand like this. I'm unconsciously doing the Vulcan greeting. Uh, your hand is like this, so your palm is facing the floor. The answer is towards the surface of the Earth. And we're not going to say into the paper here. Because we were given real directions, we need to say towards the surface of the Earth. Let me take a break here with all of this and point something out to you. We are going to be doing calculations to determine these forces. Okay? And on the exam that you will write in a couple of weeks, there will probably be a third of the exam questions that rely on you understanding directions. So if you, if you go into that exam not clear about these hand rules, you will not pass. It would be very unlikely anyway. Um, now let's talk for a second about imagine that you were in a place that you were unfamiliar with, maybe the gym, and you're, you're stressed out because it's a diploma exam. You don't know which way is north. You walk into the gym. <laughs> and you're sitting this way, and you really, you're just, oh man, which way is north? It doesn't matter. If you think you're facing north, you'll get the right answer. Because if you think you're facing north, then the magnetic field is that way, and west is that way, right? So the palm of your hand will still be facing the floor. What's important is you understand west is to the left of north. Directions. Okay, necessarily. Okay, let's do a quick demonstration here. <clears throat> now I have to turn this. I have a cathode ray tube here. It's actually part of an oscilloscope, and I've changed some of the wiring to get what I need to get here. And there's a, a plastic case that goes over it. The cathode ray tube is that metal thing. Now there's, there's actual metal shielding around it and just so you know, uh, even if this were unplugged, you wouldn't want to touch it because the cathode ray tube is firing electrons to one end of the tube and those electrons can build up 
like a capacitor. And if you unplug it and touch it, you might discharge it and it'll be very painful and potentially harmful, okay? So in order for me to get access to the tube, I had to crack the top open. So what we are going to do is turn it this way. So what we're looking at here, it doesn't matter that the handout has a rectangle that's longer. This rectangle is longer vertically rather than horizontally. That doesn't matter. Okay. The question is, that green dot that you're seeing, is it there? Yeah, that greenish dot is a whole bunch of electrons landing at the front of that screen. Okay. That's what we're talking about. And the question is, what will happen, and this is a good diploma exam question, what will happen if I bring a magnet with this orientation? You'll have to trust me, this is the south pole of this magnet, this is the north pole. What will happen if I bring a magnet in from the right? Well, the electrons are traveling this way through a magnetic field. They're going to experience a force. What direction will they be forced? Well, just before we use the right-hand rule, this is the south pole. And magnetic field lines go out of, the out of the north and into the south. So the magnetic field lines here are doing this. Right? Which means that in this region in space right here, the magnetic field is that way. magnetic field is towards the top of the page. So that would mean that our prediction here would be we have a magnetic field towards the top of the page. You might be doing it on paper by having your hand down like this. And the electrons are coming out of the page or out of the screen. And since electrons are negative, they should be forced out of the back of your hand which means this dot should move to the right. That's our prediction. We'll do all four predictions first, and then we'll check them. So you should have a dot that moves to the right. If I do this one, the bottom left on your screen, the magnetic field lines come out of the north and into the south, so they have to do this, which means the magnetic field in this region in space is predominantly towards the floor or towards the bottom of your sheet of paper and the electrons are moving out towards you, they will be forced out of the back of your hand and the back of my hand is facing left. And you know, I think to some people that's going to make sense that if this orientation pulls the electrons towards the magnet, this orientation at the bottom should push them away. Take a look at the top right. What's the direction of the magnetic field that the electrons find themselves in now? Well, magnetic field lines, generally speaking, go out of the north. So in this general space, we've got a magnetic field that is to the left, away from the magnet. So our fingers would be like this. Our thumb would be out. You have to, you have to rotate your wrist to keep your fingers in the right orientation. And now I look at the back of my hand and it's facing the top of the screen so it'll be forced up. This one magnetic field lines are going into the south so generally speaking the magnetic field is to the right. If we point the fingers to the right into the south thumb out the only way you can do that is to hold your hand in this position the back of your hand is facing the floor this dot should move to the bottom of the screen. Now, keep something in mind. The magnetic field lines are not uniform, so the only way I'm going to get a magnetic field in the first one that's directly up is right here. If I go here, it's kind of angled a bit. Uh, south to the top. I'll do it on this side of the room first. And move towards it. And all I'm demonstrating to you is that the right-hand rule is working. If I flip this over, we're talking about the bottom left prediction, which means it should move away. And it does. Uh, 
Uh, I want the top right with the north pole in. I mean, magnetic forces are weird. They're not attractive or repulsive necessarily. In this case, the force on those electrons is perpendicular to the magnet. And if we turn it around, go south pole in, the dot should go towards the bottom, and it does. If you do this with one of those cathode ray monitors, the images will be a little bit smeared around for a little while, maybe permanently. Yeah? Does the magnetic field for when we drew a diagram two days ago, it went around yep. and it entered? Is it trying to follow that at all? No. No. I, I know what you're saying and why you are asking that. What I will tell you is those field lines should never be thought of as directions that the particles will follow. And all those field lines are, all they are, it's quite complicated. Those field lines are a collection of an infinite number of different electric or magnetic field directions. So, you know, when you have When you have, uh, say, this magnetic field line here, and it loops around and comes back, what this is saying is the magnetic field here is in that direction. The magnetic field here is in that direction. Here is in that direction. It's just showing an infinite number of directions. But you know, if I put a north pole here, and somehow that north pole could take off and fly, it would be forced in this direction, but it wouldn't follow this line, that curve, because that force would pull it off of the curve and it would be in a different point in space. We would never, where we have a non-uniform magnetic field, Ian, we would never try to talk about a path of something following it. Um, if it's a uniform electric field or magnetic field, one or the other, then we can do that. Okay. All right, any questions with that last demo? Okay, so uh, I'm going to move on here. This class ends at about 10.55, I think. No, it's 10.40. Okay. I'm going to move on and, I mean, we're not going to get a day back here. We're not going to finish this next lesson and then move on tomorrow. Tomorrow we'll be practicing all of this. But I think it's a good idea while we have this second right-hand rule in our head to move on. In fact, I, I think next time I'm going to break these lessons up differently. So the first day is what we did yesterday, the second day is what we did today, and this next part of the lesson. I'm not going to spend time reviewing everything uh, other than this, what we just talked about. When you have a magnetic field and a charged particle is moving in that magnetic field, that charged particle will experience a magnetic force because that moving charge has its own magnetic field which influences or is influenced by the magnetic field that it's moving in. It's a lot to follow. The direction of that force, however, is found using the right-hand rule, the flat right-hand rule. So, Let's take a look at this next lesson. What three things do you think that magnetic force depends on? It turns out there are three things the magnetic force depends on. So imagine that we go back to the oscilloscope or the cathode ray tube that I had here, and I almost put my hand right on the top. Imagine that we go back to this, and I say to you that how much the beam moved is a measure of the amount of force. And I think you would agree. If it moved further, it would be more force involved. My question is, how could I repeat this experiment and move the beam more or less? And there's three things I could change. Although,
one of them I don't really have access to changing. Jack? And that's the one I don't really have access to changing. I'm going to make it even simpler, and rather than saying more current, have the charges moving faster. And the thing I want to impress on you is that this little circular magnetic field depends on how fast the charge is moving. It also depends on the charge. And I think you've kind of nailed it by saying current, because if you have current, that could mean they're moving faster or you have more of them. But I'm simply going to say the speed of the charge. Okay. And I'm going to take a crack that that's the first one. No, I'm going to go the third one. Maybe it's not even here. Nope. I gotta just give me a second here. There we go. So, the speed of the particle. And, and the reasoning here is that the faster the charge is moving, you can put that in one, two, or three. I don't care. The faster the particle is moving, the stronger its own personal magnetic field is going to be. So the stronger the force, the stronger the interaction. Now, I did kind of flash the other two answers, but uh, does it make sense to you that the strength of the magnetic field would determine that? I, I should have left the oscilloscope or cathode ray tube plugged in to show this to you, but I think you will remember that when I did this and I put the magnet here, it deflected the beam, but when I put it closer, it deflected the beam more. Well, if we just take one of those is an illustration to explain this. If this is the north pole, this is the south pole, magnetic field lines go out of the north. But they go out in this fashion. So in this region right here, the magnetic field is weaker than it is here because the magnetic field lines get closer together as you get closer to the magnet. I could have instead repeated the experiment with this cheapo bar magnet, we would have seen a little tiny deflection. And then when I go to that other magnet, which is quite a bit stronger, it would be more of a deflection. What's the third thing? Well, the third thing, and this, this I definitely don't have access to, is the charge on the particle. There's a lot of variables here. But if I had a beam of particles that had a greater negative charge, the amount of force on them would be greater. And uh, this is all going to come together in a second, I hope. Do you remember me saying that for a gravitational field, you need mass? I hope. For an electric field, you need charge. Does anybody remember what I told you you needed for a magnetic field? Ian? Sorry? Motion and something else. Charge. You need both of them. You need charge and motion. So think about this. If those are the... Uh, Let's go back to gravity. If I had more mass, I get more gravitational force, yes? If I have more charge, I get more electric force. If I have more charge or more motion, I get more magnetic effect or force or field. So that's why the charge and the speed are both factors here. Now I want to take this a little step further before I reveal something to you. A gravitational force compared to an electric force, compared to a magnetic force. OK. Let's see. Gravitational force, listen very carefully to the words, is the property of matter needed times the gravitational field. Yeah? Electric force is the property of matter needed times the electric field. Magnetic force is the property of matter needed, charge and motion, times the magnetic field. That's our formula for magnetic force. 
It seems more complicated than the other two because magnetism requires two things, motion and charge. So that's the formula as it appears on your formula sheet. And it is a, a little bit of a wild looking formula because, and this is the thing I don't think we're going to get to today, of this perpendicular symbol. Okay? But basically the magnetic force on a moving charge is QVB. And we're going to do a couple of examples. And then you're going to have a couple of right hand rule questions to try for homework. Okay? And then tomorrow we'll finish this up. So calculate, calculate the magnetic force, the magnitude of the magnetic force on an electron traveling at that speed through a magnetic field with that strength. QVB. That's all we need to do here. The magnetic force will have a magnitude equal to QVB. And, you know, I call it the parsley on the fish, it, the decoration. You can peel off the absolute value stuff. You can peel off the vectors. B in physics is only ever magnetic field. Fm equals QVB. So we're simply going to take the charge of an electron. We're going to multiply by the speed that it's moving at. We're going to multiply by the magnetic field strength. And for today, we're not going to worry about why that's going to give you newtons. We'll talk a bit about that tomorrow, but it's not important. So what do we get? Well, let's multiply them out. Apparently, what you get is 2.4192 times 10 to the negative 14. I'll give you a minute just to run those numbers through your calculator and make sure that you get the same thing. I'm pretty sure that's right, but it is. All right, number two. What are we asked to do here? Calculate the upward acceleration. Full stop. Stop right there. When you're asked about acceleration, you're always going to use F net equals MA. Always. Okay. Is this electron going to experience an acceleration because of gravity? No. Is it going to experience an acceleration because there's an electric force acting on it? No. It doesn't say there's an electric field. It says there's a magnetic field. So the idea is, on the one hand, you have F net equals MA. But on the other hand, you have FM, which is the net force, equals QVB. So what we do here is we say that the net force is the magnetic force. And I, I want to make sure that you truly understand what that means. I'm not saying, when I say F net equals FM, that you have two forces which happen to be equal. There's one force, and I can call it the net force, or I can call it the magnetic force. Now, how do I build a formula here? Well, F net is MA, FM is QVB, I guess MA equals QVB. And again, I. This is from last time I taught this course. I'm not even putting the numbers up here on the board. You know the mass of an electron. You know the charge of the electron. You're given the speed. You're given the magnetic field. If you want to find the acceleration, you have to take QVB divided by M. Are there three examples on this page? And apparently when you do that, you get uh, 4.5 times 10 to the 15 
meters per second squared. So I'll just give everybody a minute to make sure that you get that number. And that's where we're going to end it today. Tomorrow, we're going to do a couple more examples with this F equals QVB thing where things get a little bit more complicated. But what you are working on now, may I borrow this? What you are working on right now are the eight questions that start on page 53 of your handout. which all have to do with right hand rules and directions of fields and directions of forces. Remember when you're dealing with a single charge, a wire, or a solenoid, you're thinking curly right hand rule. But when you're dealing with finding a magnetic force acting on a particle, you're dealing with the flat right hand rule. So when you look at this sheet, the second one I gave you today, right hand rule one is all about finding a magnetic field direction. Right hand rule number two is all about finding a magnetic force on a moving charge. And you need lots of practice with this. So get those eight done. You got about uh, 10 minutes here to work on them. I should be, as I'm looking around the room, I should be seeing a lot of this, right? It's, it's not really that possible for you to do these questions, you know, just in your head.